Hello, how are you doing? I hope you had a good month in May and that you had time to get to some good reading. Uh, if you'd like to let me know in the comments below any of the best books you read last month or maybe some of the worst books that you read last month uh, or maybe even some books that you have started but then put aside and decided not to read because I had a couple of those uh, this month as well and sometimes I think it's more interesting to talk about the books that we don't persist with and, and finish reading rather than just the books you know we've read in their entirety so I'm going to discuss those as well but uh, I'm going to also get into the books that I read in, in total this month I mean I only read three books uh, in, in total, which is less than I normally read, but one of them was very long, uh, so took me quite a lot of time and I really took my time with it. And I also read some short stories, um, so uh, in a couple different collections, so I'm going to discuss uh, those as well. But why not start with the books that I put aside and decided not to finish reading, at least not for now. Uh, so the first is The Small House at Arlington by Anthony Trollope and I was really looking forward to this because I've been reading the books in his Barsetcher Chronicles and really enjoying them but this one I just didn't really get on with uh, at all. I think I read a hundred or so pages of it and just really wasn't into the story and so decided to set it aside. The way he sets up the romances in this book just felt a bit more conventional and less interesting than he has done in his previous novels so yeah just really wasn't that into it and um, yeah just seemed a bit more formulaic and I don't know if maybe I know this is one of the novels that he wrote uh, in serialized form um, unlike I think the first three novels in the series I don't think he did write in serialized form and so um, yeah, it's it's I, I'm not too sure about it or if I even want to go back to it Although the completest side of me you know, wants to to read it uh, just for to have read the entire Barsetcher Chronicles But uh, that, I don't know probably not anytime soon I'll, I'll go back to this and then the other book that I started which then decided to put aside is a very different kind of book um, which is Moon Witch Spider King by Marlon James the second book in his uh, his his uh, what is it called the Dark Star trilogy that's that's the name of it um, and and this novel focuses pretty much exclusively on a character of a witch that we met in the first novel called Sagalon and basically is her origin story uh, and uh, starts with the beginning of her life and follows her very difficult childhood and yeah and I'll, this I also read about a hundred pages of and I, I thought was engaging and interesting uh, how he was describing and building that tale that mythology around her her story but just wasn't quite in the mood for it because this is fantasy it is uh, there is a lot of violence in it and uh, yeah just wasn't really quite in the the mood for it so uh, so yeah decided to put it aside for the the moment but I, I will probably go back to it at, at some point so the first book I did read in its entirety uh, was this very short novel called cold enough for snow by Jessica Au, um, who's an Australian writer and uh, and this is a very short novel um, so I was able to read it in its entirety over the course of a day when I was traveling and going on holiday holiday to Tuscany in Italy and I got the train all the way there from London to Paris and then Paris to Milan and uh, and then um, the next day went from Milan to Pisa and um, and so yeah I read it over the course of that first day and that kind of was the perfect setting to, to read this of going on holiday because this novel is all centered around a holiday where an adult woman uh, travels with her mother um, or meets her mother in Japan in Tokyo and uh, they go on this holiday around the the country together and uh, visiting various museums and uh, and it's a quite subtle quiet novel that's really beautifully written and has all these lovely small observations in it so it was like perfect for this train journey that that I was on this very long train journey that took an entire day um, and I, I did enjoy the the subtlety of this book I don't know how much of it really stuck with me I mean it did capture that 
sense of being on holiday, you know, the kind of freedom and delight and discovery of the experience of being on holiday, but also on the, the kind of tedium of that, of, of kind of wandering around and being out of place. And yeah, the, the slightly unsettled sense of that and being able to spend time with um, someone you love um, for an extended period of time in a way that you don't in the normal course of your everyday life. Um, you know, it's a kind of almost different mode of existence, isn't it? And you sort of get that in the relationship between the the this the woman the narrator and her mother and uh, and and you don't entirely understand everything about their relationship or past um, as they're going about their days on this holiday you get little snippets um, from her personal past the narrator's past and um, these sort of scenes from her past and and you don't know entirely how they add up or if even they do have a larger meaning it's more it's just these memories are striking her as she, they're kind of wandering around, going to these museums and seeing these artifacts. And, and there is this curious wonder of, of looking at, say, an artifact from 500 BC and, and being like, wow, this is from 500 BC, but then sort of going like, huh, okay, yeah, and then moving on. And, and you do just sort of move on. And, and yeah, it's this kind of strange experience of uh, both your relationship with the person you're, you're with traveling through these spaces, but, but, uh, but then also considering your own personal relationship with history and, and the personal meaning we bring to these objects that we tour when going to these, these places on holiday. I mean, not everybody does, but you know, if you go to galleries or a museum and your experience of connecting with this piece of history and having your your own personal spin on it, but also recognizing that it's something which uh, will last, has been there for much longer than you have and will last probably much longer than than you will in your own personal story. In, and so, uh, so yeah, it's, it's raising all those, those different issues, uh, but also surprisingly towards the end of the book, she goes on this own personal quest on her own, sort of separate from her mother um, before they reunite again at a later stage. And there's this curious sense of like solitude and quiet there as, as she's determined to have this experience on her own in a place she wants to go to. And, and I found that very moving and, and beautiful um, of this quiet reflection time she has on her own apart from her mother as well as this this uh, subtle relationship between them where they they are being respectful and caring for each other and obviously love one another uh, but do have this distance from each other so it's like constantly gauging their the closeness and distance from each other so uh, yeah it's 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 quite a beautiful novel though I don't know if it's really stuck with me totally I mean it's quite short and fleeting and and yeah and there's no big sort of plot or story to it or, or at least you know not on the surface and so it's it's not the kind of book that I think will really stick with you but just more kind of resonate the meaning of it will like kind of resonate over time in these uh, these these uh, these more subtle ways and uh, but the the book that I mainly spent uh, my month with and I think I spent at least a solid three weeks reading uh, this novel Tomb of Sand uh, by Gitanjali Shri uh, translated by Daisy Rockwell and which won the International Booker Prize and and it is quite a, a long extended novel um, 730 pages long and uh, and so is a real time commitment even though yeah there are, there are these these spaces in the book and um, and the chapters some of the chapters and sections can be quite short uh, but um, but it is such a dense and detailed novel that it is a story you need to take your time with I think to really take in everything that's happening or even understand what is going on because the narrative flits between uh, lots of different perspectives and um, and so to sort of keep up with that and understand what's happening in the story um, yeah I had to really take my time with this and and think about it and reflect upon it and and also there are some passages which are 
really meaningful and and moving and um, that I really wanted to to take my time with and uh, so yeah on the surface it's a it's the kind of story that I really enjoy and that um, I I tend to love novels that focus on the perspective of older women and um, and at the center of this book is an 80 year old old woman that is mostly referred to as Ma although she's referred to a number of different names because I've seen her through the perspective of different characters and uh, and you get this <laughs> what's so bold about the novel in in a way one of the very bold, bold things about this novel is that you don't actually see her um, until about 175 pages into this novel. I mean, you see her back and she kind of has her back to both the reader and the other characters in this novel, the family around her that is all very concerned about her because she lost her husband, she's grieving for him, and she's just decided not to engage with people anymore. So she has her back to everyone. And, and so she doesn't turn around or engage with other characters until quite a bit into the novel and uh, and part of the reason she does this is because she's um, given by her grandson this this cane um, which is adorned with butterflies and seems to have these kind of magical or mystical properties to it or at least that's what some people in the community believe because they start flocking to her and um, paying tribute to this cane in this way in this kind of superstitious way which is um, um, <laughs> which is quite charming and um, and she takes it upon herself uh, at a certain point to just leave and walk out and um, and goes missing and her family gets really concerned about her but then uh, they find her and, and she decides to settle down at her daughter's home and uh, and then from there um, to go on a journey uh, back to Pakistan um, where she grew up, spent her childhood until the very disruptive events of partition which um, completely destroyed her world and uh, and meant that she had to move and um, and so yeah it um, it tells that entire story but but is mostly filled with the details and the sensory experience of this character's life and her family's life as as you follow them through their days and learn about their uh, complicated relationships with each other and with their own past and and the past of um, their origins in Pakistan and and um, and so you you follow the story and uh, and yet yeah, it, it alights on so many details which are fascinating and sumptuous and and really lovely to read about uh, there there was so much in this about food and um, and so it really I really got that sensory experience of of that but also the the beauty of Ma's saris um there's a, a, a section which goes into the perspective of a number of crows that are sort of watching the characters and and the, the crows are sort of commenting and observing all of Ma's different saris and uh, and the real beauty and intricacy of of some of these garments and um, and so I found that really lovely but then there were other sections of it which I found slightly tedious I mean I guess it kind of depended on your mood and how much you want to get bogged down in all of these details because yeah there were some sections that about kind of the pruning of trees or about Ma's constipation which it, it went into quite a lot of detail about and I was like uh, I don't know if I need all that much detail about those aspects of it um, so so yeah, I had a kind of mixed experience with different sections of this book. But then there are also sections of this book which are so much about wordplay and looking at the etymology behind words and words true meaning as opposed to how they're used in common parlance. And uh, and I thought that was so interesting. It actually reminded me quite a lot of the writing of Ali Smith. I mean, she does a lot of that in her books as well, but also questioning the the boundaries um, between things I mean so much in this book is about questioning those those boundaries uh, between many different aspects of our lives and and things in society like the boundaries between different family members the the boundaries um, between different nations the boundaries um, between different relation uh, religions or or religious experience um, the the boundaries between different classes and uh, and different genders and one of the most uh, striking and pivotal characters in this novel is a 
character named Rosie, um, who's a hijra, who's a trans woman, woman, and uh, and who's had a long-standing friendship and connection to Ma, uh, much to her family's confusion. They don't really understand why uh, Rosie has such a strong presence in Ma's life, and uh, you only find out about why Rosie has this strong connection to Ma much later in the novel, and uh, and it's really moving and meaningful how it shows that, but also how uh, Ma is so accepting of Rosie and loves Rosie as an individual, whereas some of her family members, Ma's family members, can't get past uh, Rosie's identity uh, as a trans woman, and even though some of them have, like her daughter, has these kind of progressive views, when encountering that in real life in an individual um, who doesn't fit neatly into a category of male or female, uh, how uh, that really challenges uh, the daughter's sense and understanding um, of, of people. And, and so, uh, so it's interesting how Ma is kind of, has this like, liberated sense of, of not wanting to be uh, confined or, or be seen as just a, an old woman who's near the end of her life. Um, she still thinks there's so much more experience to be had and, and discoveries to be made. And, um, and it's wonderful and joyous how she breaks out of this, this mold and these expectations on her to go on this journey and um, to examine the, the past and, and to have these new experiences. And, it's, um, and it gets quite dramatic uh, towards the end of the book. And, uh, and so I was really gripped towards the end, even though quite a lot of the book, it's going at this kind of leisurely pace where you're um, you're following the details of, of their lives. And there's this absolutely beautiful passage that um, I want to read because uh, I think it really captures almost the poetic beauty of, of capturing those small details about the, the characters' lives. So there's this chapter, um, chapter 9, which uh, begins with the line, uh, Sounds of Peace. The scritch scritch of the broom on the street, the newspaper man's sandals running, the smack of the newspaper dropping, the outside door as it opens, a shaft of sunlight jumping in, a speck of grime flying with it, the rustling of paper as headlines are read, the riffling of pages, branches brushing their leaves against the window, one leaf sighing floating down to earth, the meow meow of peacocks in the thicket across the street. One can hear the fanning of their feathers, their feet circling in dance, the sisterhood of Ma and the sunshine, their whisperings, their quiet voices, the fine stream of water lapping the inside of the cup as it's poured from the kettle, the sunshiny tea emerging from the see-through kettle is a sweet silence. All the same, Ma adds two spoonfuls of honey. If you watch the champa flowers fall, you will hear the sound they make. A maid rattles a bucket in another flat. Someone pounds fresh spice. The sweet scent sings. Someone grinds cardamom in a mortar. The heart is gladdened. Ma takes a long sip as though drinking in a bird's song. A bird chirps in response outside. The society gardener's trowel speaks in the earth. Scrape, scrape. So yeah, it's... It, there are sections which, yeah, do almost read like like poetry in their in their simplicity and evoking the sensory experience, and it's just describing someone making tea in the morning. But but this is, this does does like fill you with the the senses of the character and uh, characters and and what it is like uh, doing this in in the morning, which is both an experience that anyone can relate to, but also has these details in it which are specific to the characters in their place and time. And uh, and so I think it's so wonderfully evocative in, in that way. And I just enjoyed uh, that that whole experience and being immersed in the, the whole world of this woman and this family um, around her and uh, and the, their story and their history. So, so yeah, I really appreciated and enjoyed this book overall, um, even though it is quite a time commitment. 
Uh, so then the, the next book um, I read is another like fairly short book and I, I read this as part of a, a book group that I'm uh, part of and we uh, met last night to discuss uh, it all. Um, so it's it's Bola by Pajtim Statovshi, um, who is a Finnish author um, of Albanian origin and uh, and um, he's lived basically his whole life in Finland and it's translated from the, the Finnish um, but, uh, but he has written two previous books um, that are both, I think, about the um, his family origins and history, and um, and meditating upon that. And this novel is also uh, about that. It's a story of uh, a, a man who's uh, Albanian, and um, his experiences before the Kosovo War have. Uh, he is kind of pressured into getting into this marriage um, with a, a woman um, by his family and uh, and then starts having children with her um, but he also meets another man um, who's a Serbian man and uh, they uh, have this passionate relationship with each other over the course of a summer um, so it describes that but then also the aftermath of that when they are split apart by war and uh, and following their experiences and the narrative is divided between both um, his perspective, the Albanian man's perspective, and also the Serbian man's perspective as he's writing these entries, uh, these kind of journal entries, and you're you're not really sure where they're going or where they're coming from at first, but then it, that's gradually revealed over the course of the story and um, through the alternating narrative. Uh, but th there's also a third strand to the narrative, which is this kind of mythological or religious um, narrative about the story between God and the devil and God uh, giving to the devil uh, a, his daughter um, for uh, in exchange um, for for something, and um, and so the the negotiation of that and the and the the consequence of what happens to the the daughter um, and her relationship with the snake and the sort of mingling with this the snake and uh, this bola and uh, and the the whole meaning of that and that kind of subtly builds upon this larger. story story um, to kind of comment on the the muddiness between good and evil and uh, because a lot of the characters are listed or at least the the central character of the Albanian character in this is a very unlikable person in a lot of ways although he is also sympathetic and uh, what he's going to but he um, a lot of his actions are really horrible um, he beats both his wife and his children um, he treats people in in a kind of horrible way as the the story goes on and is in many ways very selfish but is also quite sympathetic in um, his his desire to be a, a writer. Um, he he's a great reader. Um, he he has a great passion for for reading and uh, and his the difficulty of his uh, his experiences growing up and being pressured into a situation which he's not happy in. And so I, I understand that and feel the pressure, but also I'm very critical of him because of the horrible actions that he he takes and so uh so yeah it's a very moving story and narrative um that is about suppressed desire and passion and how that desire and passion is not just for other people but also for the person that we want to become that we uh, desire to become but because of circumstances weren't allowed to become and um and so that disruption in our lives um, when when we can't fully realize our potential or or what we wanted to do in our lives or who we wanted to be with and uh, and it's really moving and complex how it tackles that um I did have some issues with uh, certain aspects of the story um, there's a section where he has to go to prison for a, a certain reason and um, and it describes his time in prison as almost this relaxing like almost holiday type relief and that he's just able to sort of be on his own and read a lot and uh, and I know that there are lots of different kinds of prisons and lots of different kinds of prison experience based on you know socioeconomic factors and and what country or community the the prison happens to be in but uh, but yeah I just slightly questioned that of, of whether like is prison really like a holiday like that um yeah I, I was slightly uh concerned about how it handled that but then also in his time after prison where it it strangely um he he goes back to his uh his 
home city in, in Albania and uh, and he describes how he has difficulty adjusting to the lack of physical touch with other people and also the sense of uh, not really having anything to do, the sort of tedium of that, um, which is kind of strange since he just spent almost a year in or around about a year in prison and, and uh, much of which he was confined in his cell and um, he was in a cell on his own. Um, it describes how he did that. And so um, so unless it sort of skipped over some physical contact he had in prison, um, it, it, uh, it, it, it's strange that he has to grow accustomed to not having physical contact when he's not had that for quite a long time. Yeah, so I, I, I was slightly concerned about some of these seeming um, inconsistencies in, in the story. But, um, but on the whole, I thought it was really powerful and moving story uh, looking at, particularly because it doesn't actually depict a war, but it shows the uh, building up to a war and then the aftermath of a war and the reverberating consequences of that on a personal level for both the central men in this story and uh, and the the meaning of that and uh, and there's some really brutal and heartbreaking parts to this story which were difficult to to read but um but I thought were really powerful in the statement that that they were making um so so yeah I'd really um this is the first book I've read by this author um and I would like to to read his previous uh two books so then um quite briefly I just want to talk about some stories I read um so I I read some of the stories in Italo Calvino's uh, The Complete Cosmic Comics um which is such a playful and enjoyable book and so up my alley in terms of my interests in that I have this real geeky interest in science and outer space and uh, sort of the, the origin stories of the, the actual natural origin stories of, of planet Earth and how we came to be here and, and all of that stuff. And, um, and I think Calvino had um, real scientific knowledge of, of the, the actual truth behind all of those things. Um, but then builds it into this playful mythology of uh, of origin stories of following this character um, through these uh, the the beginnings of earth and um, and the beginnings of the cosmos and and uh, and sort of following uh, this character as well as characters around them um, through uh, these origins and uh, and so there's this like wonderful story about the moon and the the relationship with the moon how early on the moon was would physically um revolve around the earth um at a much closer distance um than it has become in our own times and how uh and how he and these characters would sort of jump between the moon and come and go farming on the moon and then jump back to the earth and the gravitational relationship between the earth and the moon and then how that changed uh, quite suddenly and and uh, and the effect that had um, both on a personal level for them but then also for the wider geology of, of, of uh, and um, relationship between between uh, these these heavenly bodies and uh, and uh, so it's so beautiful how he and playful how he writes those things and so yeah these stories have been such a joy to read I was reading them aloud to my partner on our holiday um some of them and um and so yeah it was it was really pleasurable to do that and then also then have some discussions about science and um because my partner doesn't have any interest in outer space or the the sort of origins of, of earth and how it came to be in the creation of, of the sun and our galaxy and, and all of that sort of stuff and so and because I've watched all these geeky programs about outer space I was able to explain to him some of those those details and how these stories even though they're quite fantastical are based in real science and um, so yeah is really enjoying these and and want to continue and to read more of them and then also I um, read some stories from Cursed Bunny by Bora Chan um, and uh, and yeah uh, as I expressed in my video talking about the International Booker Prize um the the winner um yeah the the, the stories of these are quite gruesome or at least the the very first story is about a individual that sort of pops up in the toilet and this individual that has been reconstructed from uh, feces and refuse that has been flushed down the toilet and how this individual is kind of creating a body for 
herself from these discarded <laughs> Uh, refuse and uh, so yeah it's a bit stomach churning uh, but uh, but does build to quite a like weird and wonderful story of the relationship between this individual that pops up in the toilet and a woman that sees her there and uh, and I love the breeziness of how the other characters around this woman aren't really surprised by the appearance of this this head in a toilet and uh, and uh, just sort of like oh just ignore it just flush it down it's fine <laughs> and uh, and so the the sort of shockingness of of that but then how it builds to this larger meaning about uh, both uh, womanhood and motherhood and the relationship between mothers and children and uh, but also larger means about how people in our lives can become discarded and uh, and we can leave them behind or ignore them and uh, and then other people that we do value and hold close to us and uh, and I feel like a lot of stories or at least the stories I've read so far deal with uh, a lot of these issues in a in a really creative and fantastical way and quite a creepy and, and uh, kind of horror story uh, way but um, but in a way that I'm finding quite compelling um, but also slightly disturbing and and I had a, a quite like disturbing and upsetting dream uh, recently after reading uh, both this and and Bola uh, where uh, it was a very vivid dream where I, I dreamed I was an old man and that I had been married to a woman for a long time and this woman was terminally ill and I was sat at her deathbed and her final one of her final wishes was that I make for her this uh, dinner, a final meal of her favorite food. And so I c cooked this meal for her and was sat there at her hospital bed with her trying to have this meal, but because she was so ill, she wasn't able to eat, um, but she wanted me to eat uh, this this meal. And so it, it was such a vivid dream of, of trying to force myself to eat this food while she was lying there watching me and knowing that she was going to die and um, but trying to force myself to, to eat this food because it's her final request and uh, and so that yeah, was such a heartbreaking dream that I did like physically wake up weeping and crying um, because of the tragedy of this this dream and this circumstance, which is so ridiculous because it was just a dream, uh, but it was so vivid and felt so real. And so, uh, so yeah, it had this like disturbing effect on me and the fact that I was married to a woman you know, rather than a, a man, the, the partner I've been with for um, a very long time. And, uh, and so, yeah, it was quite odd and I don't know where it came from or what it meant, but, uh, but yeah, that's the kind of effect that fiction can have on you, I think, or, or at least maybe subtly. I mean, I'm sure a lot of it had to do with my own psychology but but yeah the um how sometimes we can have these very vivid dreams after reading fiction um especially fiction that is quite fantastical and um and and almost dreamlike in itself so uh yeah um i i don't know i didn't expect to talk about that but yeah went into that of this like random dream that i had but uh yeah, so those are the things that I read over the, the month of May. Um, I'd love to know if you've read any of these books, if you have any thoughts about them or feelings about them, or if you're interested in reading them now, or if you want to let me know about some things you've read over the past month and the effect that they've had on you. Um, I'd love to hear about that in the comments below. But I hope you're doing well and you're reading good things, and I'll speak to you again soon. Bye-bye.